This is Cloudy with a Chance of IOCs with Zach Allen. Um, before Zach takes the stage, I'd like to thank our gold sponsor with Secure. With, excuse me, with Secure is cybersecurity's reliable partner. The largest financial institutions, manufacturers, and thousands of the world's most advanced communications and technology providers trust with, excuse me, I cannot say that, with Secure uh, for outcome-based cybersecurity that protects and enables their operations. They are also running a CTF, which you can check out in the Ford CloudSec channel in Slack. Over to you, Zach. Cool, thank you. Hi, everyone. Thanks for coming to my talk today. Cloudy with a Chance of IOCs, the second talk at Ford CloudSec with the name Cloudy with a Chance of in the beginning. Um, so today, uh, I'm going to talk about a few things specifically related to how cloud threat detection and threat intelligence can kind of come together, and just kind of some of the problems that I've seen in the past working in tradition threat intel, and talk about some of the advantages that uh, cloud security has when they kind of go and reason about intelligence and build things like reporting and analyses and things like that. I have 20 minutes, so uh, it's a lot of content to get through. Here's the basic outline, and my hope today is that by the end, you can kind of approach how you do reporting, blog posts, incident reports with just a little bit more rigor, and if you can just leave with just that, I'm gonna be very, very happy. So, real quick, who am I? Um, I'll have QR codes throughout this whole presentation just so you can do a quick snap. Um, that's going to link to the short link at the bottom, which is just my GitHub splash page, and the code that I'm using for the demo here is just going to be pinned on my GitHub repo. Um, but I worked at the places at the top, I went to the uh, school at the places at the bottom, um, I'm currently the Director of Security Detection and Research at Datadog, um, and when I'm not doing a fun security stuff, we're trading a lot of stickers. So if you come by our booth, we have all kinds of weird Datadog stickers. Um, really fun stuff that, uh, you know, this is kind of like almost a black market in some cases, so it's a lot of fun. So, the idea of threat intelligence uh, can talk a lot about this. And like I said, I have 20 minutes to kind of give you that brief introduction. So, when people, um, talk about threat intelligence, many definitions come up. This is one of them. I really want folks to really focus on what's in bold here throughout this talk. Don't worry, you, have, you don't have to memorize it. I'm gonna be bringing this along with us as we kind of look at different ways to do reporting and different ways to um, reason about certain types of attacks in a cloud environment. So, we do a lot of cloud threat detection at Datadog. We have products that use it. Um, and basically what happens is you need certain methodologies to kind of get the best bang for your buck as you're looking for bad guys inside your infrastructure. This is a pretty famous model called the Pyramid of Pain. I'm sure folks have seen this, but the basic premise behind it is that as you're looking in, at building and finding those bad guys inside your environment, you wanna cause the most pain as possible when you build your detections. So if you start with something like hash values, it's very trivial for a threat actor to kind of change the value of your hash. As you kind of move up the pyramid of pain, you cause a lot more pain towards the actor with your detections, and you just get a lot more return on investment, and your hope is to be right at the top at TTBs and tools. So, threat intelligence is kind of overloaded term. What I'm talking about in this talk is specifically cyber threat intelligence, but this is just like a small piece of the whole pie um, threat intelligence and, and intelligence in general is something that's been around for thousands of years, and there are a lot of methodologies behind it. And so when you're kind of reasoning about this too, just know that a lot of the stuff that we apply at, in cyber threat intelligence or CTI, this comes from many years of probably military and intelligence practitioners, and it's just a really good way for you to kind of reason about and, and, and remove biases from your reporting. So when a lot of people think about threat intelligence, they, they think of this. Um, not everyone, but basically an IP address feed. And these IP addresses may have some label attached to it. This is a good IP address, this is a bad IP address. I don't know what this IP address is, it's not either good or bad. Um, and this is kind of what we've done in like the network and host space, and a lot of companies have made a lot of money selling these. And they sell these through feeds. And from these feeds, and maybe you're, you're a SOC analyst or you're working for a company that wants to defend you know, your perimeter, you buy a bunch of these feeds, and you're like, great, I'm doing threat intelligence. Well, I'm gonna show you a couple problems here with it, and I'll focus specifically on what's highlighted in red. Um, but basically, you might have a setup here where you're pulling in flow logs, and all these flow logs come in from the left, and they kind of move through this system that'll extract, transform, and load these different flow logs and see if a bad IP address is in any of those flow logs. And maybe it goes out to a separate log store or a learning database. But the problem here is, um, let's just say you go and look up an IP address and you apply a new column, is malicious. What does malicious actually mean 
in this context. So as you're working through this flow log and maybe you're looking at an alert, what kind of context does it have? There's some local IP address that connected to some remote IP address and it's bad. Well, what is bad? What does malicious actually mean here? What are the mechanisms that are in place? How did it connect to it? You may have some information like TCP and port, but really nothing else. There are indicators in there, but the, if the indicator is just an IP address, you're just missing a lot of specificity in how you deal with a, an alert like this. There are basically no implications here. What does it mean to connect to, out to something like this? What, what is going to happen next or what is currently happening? And there's certainly no advice. So basically what the system did was take machine-generated data and turn it into more machine-readable data, and then as a human, you're reading this and you're not really checking any of these boxes here. And so as you're thinking about building alerts, detections, blog posts, research, all that great stuff, my hope is that you kind of remember this table rather than that long, pithy definition as you kind of think about how you perform your analysis. So then the question becomes, um, you know, threat intelligence for the cloud, is it feasible? And I'm gonna look at a couple of different um, pieces of, of, of technologies here that I think we kind of lucked out on a little bit um, because I would have killed for context like this uh, doing more traditional threat intelligence and kind of network and host security. So a lot, many folks think CTI lives here. Um, so anything from network to hash uh, on the pyramid of pain. And that's okay, this can be effective. It's easy to write these detections, but it doesn't really cause a lot of pain. So what I did is I pulled a CloudTrail log, you know, just from the Amazon main website, and I looked at all the different key values, and I added one additional field on there. And that field is, is bad IP address. And the malicious IP address that you have is just kind of, I, I put that in there too. So when you go through the same table, you start filling in a couple more things and you start feeling a little bit better at it. So context, you have a lot more context here. Everything from the event name, uh, the user identity, the source, the time, all of that stuff is kind of encapsulated in here. You do have the mechanisms specifically with the event name, AWS console sign in, you have what user agent made um, that request, so this is doing a lot better. We still have indicators in here and we have more indicators, not just the IP address. So this can be everything from the account ID, access key ID and things like that. Still really no implications, like what does it mean that a malicious IP address logged in through AWS console? Like it doesn't, doesn't really tell me anything when I do this reporting and it certainly does not have any advice. So what I did is I went to the literature. Um, some folks may be running MISP here locally or they worked with MISP before, Malware Information Sharing Platform. It does exactly what you think it, uh, it, uh, the name implies. It allows you to quickly share different types of indicators of compromise and different incident types with each other and within different MISP instances. I went to their MISP Galaxy repo and I didn't really see anything in there that had any uh, cloud specific kind of terminology um, or taxonomies. So I thought that was interesting. The big guns in threat intelligence uh, is something called the STIX framework. So this is built by Oasis. If you want some really light reading tonight when you're in bed after Ford CloudSec, go ahead and scan that and check it out. Um, I couldn't find anything in there that talked about cloud specific infrastructure or any type of events. It does a really good job of showing relationships between things, but I think threat intelligence is still very much in the realm of host and network while the cloud is just kind of you know, moving a lot faster. So what did I, I, I came to kind of like an impasse here, um, and it reminded me of this XKCD comic. I saw all these different standards, it didn't fit my specific use case. So as a computer scientist, what do we do? We make up a new standard, right? Um, but not really. Uh, I, luckily, I, I, I dug a little bit deeper, and I really love the MITRE attack framework, and specifically how us as a community are applying it to cloud environments. And I found this project called the MITRE attack sightings project. And what I wanted to do was basically take CloudTrail logs, do that same ETLing feature that I showed you um, in that original diagram and apply it to the cloud, uh, to the sightings format. And you get a couple benefits from this. Um, QR code there for sightings, if you wanna go and check out and read their documentation. Um, the basic premise is that they wanted to build this format that removed as many cognitive biases as possible. I know everyone here has probably written some type of analysis for their job, for their blog post or things like that. Um, unless you're specifically trained to do this full time, you almost always are adding biases to your data and to your analysis, like some of the ones here. So um, it's just really important that we can kind of remove the human element out of this by forcing them to adhere to a specific format, which I think this does a good job of. There are three types of like sightings, formats, or indicator types. 
Um, the first one is a direct sighting of a technique. I couldn't think of any other icon for a technique when I was typing in freeicons.com and I just saw that and I was like, this is awesome. So, um, so direct sighting of a technique, direct sighting of software. This is basically a piece of software or binary running on a system that you own and an indirect sighting of software. This could be like you're running a MISP instance and you see something else and you're like, oh, I can say that that is also malicious although it didn't run on my infrastructure. For the purpose of this talk, I'm just gonna focus on direct sighting and technique. It has nothing to do with the icon with the guy making a kick right here. So basically, what I had to do was turn what's on the left, which is a CloudTrail log um, format, and then turn it into the format on the right. So this is kind of a solved problem. I think um, folks might cringe or start crying a little bit on the inside if I mention Logstash or Grok. I know I cry a little bit on the inside when I have to set up Logstash or Grok. Um, luckily, there's a lot of different frameworks that can do this, and um, I use a technology called Vector. Um, Vector is just like a really lightweight way to basically do what you see here visually. And, has, and it does a really good job and has a nice domain-specific language, it's fast, um, and it just kind of natively integrates with a lot of different technologies. So the basic premise behind this was I'm going to ingest some CloudTrail logs. Um, I'm then going to kind of expand their, cloud, their native format out and then run it through two different scenarios. I'm gonna use something called Stratus Red Team, which I'll talk about in the next slide, to see if these log logs came from Stratus. I'm gonna apply the MITRE attack signings framework after I do some processing of Stratus logs, or if it just kinda of came from something like your CloudTrail um, environment, I can go directly into the sightings format. For those, those that don't know Stratus, it's a really neat tool. Um, I think it just crossed 1,000 stars, so shout out to Christoph uh, who set this up. Um, but the basic premise is threat emulation in the cloud. For um, experiments basically just like this, I wanted to take a certain subset of data and have it be contained, and I wanted to see what it looked like when I put it into a different format. And the specific attack I used for the demo is just a persistence attack. I, it's the third one down, create an administrative IM user. So please go check it out. Um, you know, it, it, it's one of our more popular projects and it's doing really well right now and it's really great for experimentation like this. So I needed to do two things. Um, I needed to see if I can get to advice uh, of that table, and I needed to see if I can get to implications. Well, the implications part um, can be solved through something like this. This is called an enrichment table. Um, it's it's uh, basically like a key value lookup that Vector uses. And I took some event names, about 60 of them, and I mapped them to a corresponding MITRE attack technique on the right. I used that through some of the documentation through Stratus. Also, Expel had a really good AWS mind map that I used. Um, last time I checked, um, there's like 11,000 API calls in AWS and probably just as much event names. So just a small, small part of um, what we can actually go and map out totally. But as we run these attacks, you'll notice that I'm, running, I'm throwing these techniques on top of them and that provides that implications portion. So what this does is if I go and I take this data and I share it with somebody else, my hope is that with this format, with the implications in play, you're really starting to move towards the top of that pyramid of pain. So for demo, I have a video. Um, like I said, this is on the GitHub, on that QR code. I'll put it again at the, at the, at the end of the, the talk. But here, I'm just showing this is the native format of CloudTrail logs. I'm gonna use JQ to kind of show like, hey, pull out the record, show me all the separate CloudTrail logs in an array. And I specifically ran the attack with Stratus, I am create admin user. And here. So native CloudTrail format, just like I said before, but there are a lot more logs in here. And this is kind of what I wanted to show what, what Vector could do. Because we're in like a sandbox environment, it's a pretty contested environment that we have at our work where there's a lot of attacks going on. I wanted to get rid of all the noise and I used Vector to do that. And this is basically what you're going to do with Vector or any type of um, framework like this where you have so many things going on in your environment but you really wanna focus on the attacks. I'm gonna run Vector here. Um, you pass it a configuration file. Um, there's a domain specific language it uses. Um, all of this is on the GitHub. You can go and check that out. But it basically is performing what that graphic showed. I take data in one format, extract, transform, load it into a separate format. So you see vector boot up here, and then it'll output some JSON to console, but it'll also output some of it to, um, to a file. And so we're just gonna look at the file real quick. So, this is the MITRE attack sightings framework um, kind of key value mapping, the JSON structure I showed earlier, detection type, and they have documentation on all this in their data model. I used the first event ID that I saw. 
Um, and then I still save the event IDs afterwards. The software name, which is just the user agent from CloudTrail. This is encoding a lot of really interesting information for you to kind of take and, and, and act on it, either in an alert or in a report or anything like that. So the techniques is probably the most interesting part of the MITRE ATT&CK sightings framework, or, or uh, yeah, the, the framework um, data model. And this just kind of goes through and it says like, hey, Stratus ran and it, and it went through four separate API calls and then it created an admin user. So this is an attack. And now that attack is encoded into one singular log versus four separate logs. And what's nice is Stratus allows me to do that because I can go and I can reduce on the user agent, which I can show here in a second. And then um, it allows me to really quickly orient myself and kind of build a detection from this. And then the last part, the implications part, is right here under the platform and technique ID. So you see AWS here, you see the techni technique ID of persistence, and now you have just a lot better package to work with when you're building out your detections. So there's still a problem though. I think I hit implications, I still didn't hit that advice portion. This is where humans come in. Um, so I, you can use any tool you want. I use JQ to kind of look at all the different sightings data. Here specifically, I slurped using JQ all of the different logs, and then I grouped by the software name, and I can see, okay, which ones do I want to look at, and which ones are interesting. And to me, it's anything with the software name or user agent of Stratus Red Team. You can also go and really look through those software names, pull out anything that starts with Stratus, pull out the techniques, and then look at those in combination of those MITRE ATT&CK technique IDs. And so very quickly, I'm looking at this data, and I can say anything past that TA007 in the middle and down, um, that's just kind of noise, but the first one that I see, that's the one I want to write my detection on. Um, so it's, it's really useful when you're kind of going through these and you're building these things out. So, back to my table. Um, looking at MITRE ATT&CK sightings as a format itself, um, I really like it. Um, there are still a few issues with it, and I'm just gonna kinda go through and fill all these out. I think I hit the implications part with this format. I still didn't hit the advice part. And MITRE ATT&CK sightings also still is very host and network and data plane centric. It's not as much control plane centric. So I had to really kind of fudge a few things together and stuff it in there. And so it didn't really make it easy for me to really nail every single green check mark here and absolutely not nail the advice check mark. But what does that mean? That means that everyone here is hopefully human. I mean, that would be interesting if there are aliens in this room. But uh, you need to take this machine readable data and make it human readable, right? You need to give that advice. You need to give that analysis on top of it. And so you can generate as much of this interesting data as you want, but if you share that with somebody else, there might be a bias that they have or that you have in how they interpret the data. So as you're kind of going and building out all of your detections, all of your blog posts, all of your research, just always think in the back of your head, like how opinionated do I want to be? And can I like show my work with that as well? So in conclusion, Pyramid of Pain. Um, Go ahead and Google this. I, I promise it's the top result. I, I want everyone here to inflict as much pain as possible um, by focusing on tools and TTPs rather than those easier kind of trivial hash values and host and network artifacts. Um, it's gonna take a little bit more work, but I promise it's gonna have a lot better payoff. Context is everything in threat intelligence. So you, know, you just wanna make sure it's understandable for both humans and machines. There's human-generated data, machine-generated data, and then human-readable data and machine-readable data. So just know that as you're kind of translating these things that your precision might be affected, the context might be affected, and just keep that in the back of your mind. Um, when it comes to sharing intelligence, there are so many frameworks out there to kind of speak that same language. Some folks are really ride or die on sticks. Some folks are really ride and die on something else. When you're just talking with somebody, whether it's somebody else on your team or your manager or another company, just have the same definitions. I'm not too hard and fast on frameworks. I just wanna make sure that if I'm sharing with somebody or they're sharing with me, we're just talking about the same thing. And then lastly, minor attack sightings. Good start, far from perfect. Um, you know, Datadog's exploring a relationship with them now to kind of give them more sightings data. They're trying to build like a Verizon DBIR-like program using this type of format. So if it's interesting, go and check out the sightings website um, and go and email them and they're, uh, they're, they're great and they've hopped on every call that we requested them uh, to hop on. 
So um, questions, feedback, contact information, I promised that QR code it would appear again. That's me, that's my Twitter. I think I was at 999 followers this morning, so I just need one more. So if anything, take away anything from this talk, you helped me hit four digits for followers. So thank you so much. So we did have one question, really good feedback. Um, they love this talk, and can it be extended to Azure and GCP? It can. Uh, for Ford CloudSec, I had to choose one. And I know AWS the most, so if you want to do Azure and GCP, hit me up. I'd love to work with you on it. Questions in the room? Yes. I think we have a microphone. OK, perfect. Uh, great talk. Uh, so for Vector, I believe it was, mm -hmm. do you also pull out like the request parameters and stuff like that and like, you know, list those out? Yeah, um, I, I pull for this specific demo, and you can go and check out the GitHub page. I, I didn't want to remove any information, but it started to get ugly when I, when I didn't translate everything. So in MITRE tax sightings, there's a raw data field, and what I did is I basically took the CloudTrail log and stuffed it in that raw data field, and then kind of did my additional mappings by working my way like upwards from there. So not ideal, like I said, um, for like this cloud-specific format, but I'd rather have more information and cut the fat off than barely any information and then make stuff up, so. Anything else? Great, thank you, everyone. Thank you, Zach.